Hey guys, it's Dr. Price with Action Potential Mentoring, and today we're going to be covering the highest yield cardio concepts for the USMLE Step 2 CK. This will be applicable for your family med shelf and your internal medicine shelf as well. Here's how to get in contact. I'm the most active on Twitter. It's action underscore AP if you're interested in following. Here's our other contact information. It'll be in the link in the description. All right, so first off, we're going to talk about long QT syndrome. The number one thing you want to watch out for with long QT syndrome is torsades de points. And so what you can do to prevent that is to implant a cardiac defibrillator to prevent torsades. And this gets asked from time to time. I've seen some prior NBME questions. And so for your family med shelf, you need to know with long QT syndrome, you have to tell these patients to respectfully avoid contact or high impact sports due to the risk of sudden cardiac death. You don't want their catecholamines to shoot up and to push them towards that sudden cardiac death. Remember, you can also see that with hokum. So don't just jump on hokum the second you see sudden cardiac death in a younger patient. Number two, if you see a fixed split S2, that's an atrial septal defect until proven otherwise. I've relied on this little hint to get me so many questions over the years. If you see fixed split S2, boom, atrial septal defect. Next. All right, a teenager comes in, they have an asymptomatic murmur. It's not affected by preload or afterload exercises. So you can raise their legs up, you can valsalva, you can inspir do some inspiration. Because remember, if you inspire, it increases the preload back to your heart. And that's essentially a benign murmur. And so you don't do anything for these patients. They might even say in the questions to them, oh, a patient casually noted that they were lightheaded or short of breath three weeks ago, but they feel better now. Don't let that throw you off. That's just there to kind of make it a confounding question. Because if they said patient's perfectly healthy, never had any issues and has a small little murmur, obviously you'd put nothing. So don't let the question trick you. But if the question says that it's a holosystolic or a diastolic murmur, or the patient has congenital heart issues, you always need to get an echo to work it up further. And you're going to notice as we go through this guide that all the treatments are in yellow. All of the diagnoses modalities are in orange and anything that I've found as a dead giveaway as a TQ on a question is in red. All right, number four, somebody comes in with chest pain, decreased partial pressure of CO2, decreased oxygen levels, tachycardic, and an EKG with the S1Q3 T3 findings. That is not cardiac. Even though you see EKG findings, that's going to be a pulmonary embolism. You need to know this S1Q3 T3 is not very sensitive in real life, but it shows up a lot on your boards. And so you're going to see prominent S waves in lead one. You're going to see Q waves in lead three that dip down like this. And then you're going to see inverted T waves also in lead three. So that's S1, Q3, T3. And so next thing that you want to keep in mind for pulmonary embolism is where did it come from? Oftentimes these patients need a venous duplex of their lower extremities and it's put on anticoagulation like heparin drip. All right, next, number five, hepatojugular reflux plus an S3 or S4 heart sound is CHF until proven otherwise. There's other things that can cause it, but on your NBMEs, I want you to jump straight to CHF unless there's something else in the question stem that points away from CHF. So some other conditions that have hepatojugular reflux, and keep in mind, this is you push on the abdomen and then you see prominent JVD. These are going to be right-sided heart issues that are unable to accommodate the increased preload. Okay, so stuff like CHF, right-sided heart infarct, constrictive pericarditis, or restrictive cardiomyopathy. So these conditions, they can't accommodate the increased blood back to the heart from pushing on the abdomen, shooting the venous return back up to the heart. And so these patients will have this hepatojugular reflux. This is something that I was not very comfortable with on step two, but it does actually show up. And so a high-yield TQ is that cardiac tamponade does not have an increased hepatojugular reflux. And this is how students can oftentimes get tripped up. And I think about this is you increase that venous preload back to the heart and it just goes around the heart. It doesn't actually go back into the heart itself. All right, so number six, patient comes in, they have shortness of breath, fever, tachycardic, low blood pressure, perihilar fluid on their imaging and cardiomegaly. You do an echo and this patient has a decreased ejection fraction. Oftentimes on questions, it'll say an EF of 15 to 35%. That tells you this patient has acute myocarditis. So things you want to look for with myocarditis is the decreased EF. As you'll see, I bolded that here for this reason. 
other things that are important is these patients will have a fever or a recent febrile illness. So keep that in mind with acute myocarditis. And we're going to compare and contrast myocarditis, pericarditis, et cetera, in just a little bit. So let's say you have a question that gives you a Coxsackie virus infection, a parvovirus B19 infection, or recent doxorubicin usage. This could be a clue for the diagnosis of acute myocarditis. These patients also may have autoimmune associations such as lupus or sarcoidosis. All right, so myocarditis can be very mild or it can be like legit devastating heart failure. And so they will usually test this in a younger patient to show you that it's not acute coronary syndrome like a STEMI. So this would be like a 25-year-old comes in, has chest pain, you do an echo, their EF is 20%. They had a fever two days ago. What is it? Boom, acute myocarditis. All right, and so you want to watch out for a test question that could say, what is this condition associated with? They love the associations on step two. And so myocarditis is associated with arrhythmias due to disruptions of the conducting system in the heart. So they may just casually mention patient has some PACs or they have some PVCs, some little preventricular contractions that show up on the EKG. And so you want to keep that in mind for acute myocarditis. Next thing. How do you treat acute myocarditis? Remember, it's in yellow because it's, it's a treatment here. So you're going to do supportive therapy and treat whatever the underlying cause is. Patient's dehydrated. They might need some fluids. If they have an infection that's bacterial, you can give them some antibiotics. You want to treat the underlying cause. And so the way that students get tripped up on the exam with acute myocarditis is they see the low EF and they immediately think, oh, maybe the patient's having a heart attack. And so they send the patient to the cath lab. That is not correct. So if you see the low EF plus the fever, you're not thinking send the patient to the cath lab because that's not the problem, right? It's not a coronary vessel that's occluded. It is the myocardium of the heart is actually inflamed. All right, number seven, acute pericarditis. These patients will also be short of breath, have fevers, but the EKG is going to tell you what the difference is. So with pericarditis, they're going to have widespread ST elevations as well as PR depressions. And so... I think of pericarditis as like pancarditis, meaning all of the EKG leads are going to show ST elevations. Okay, so this is a money shot on your exam. You absolutely have to know that. So pericarditis will usually have a normal EF. So your ejection fraction is not going to be like 20% like you'll see with myocarditis. All right, so pericarditis doesn't even affect the myocardium. So it's not going to be affecting your contractile elements of your heart. So what do you do to treat acute pericarditis? You want to give them anti-inflammatory medications like indomethacin, NSAIDs, steroids, or colchicine, right? In myocarditis, remember, you support therapy, treat the underlying cause. Pericarditis, you actually treat the inflammation itself. All right, so let's move on to constrictive pericarditis. So this is chest pain that is worse with inspiration, but better if the patient leans forward. And so the murmur is going to be coarse. It's going to be like sandpaper diastolic friction rub. You need to be familiar with that phrase for constrictive pericarditis. And these patients will often have a fever as well. They can be a little bit hypotensive. You might see blood pressures in the 90s or 100 systolics. They can be tachycardic as well, but don't get thrown off. So let's go through all the differences right now that will be kind of the one-hit wonder, one-liner TQs that can get you the answer and separate this on your exam itself. So if you see diastolic friction rub, boom, constrictive pericarditis. If you see widespread ST elevation coupled with PR depressions, boom, acute pericarditis. If you see a decreased EF, boom, acute myocarditis. So if the patient is worse when lying down or coughing, and it's better if they lean forward, you're thinking acute pericarditis. All right, moving on to 10. So here's a little EKG. You see regular narrow complexes. It's exacerbated by alcohol, nicotine, caffeine, or stress you're thinking of PSVT, a paroxysmal supraventricular tachycardia. Oftentimes in the hospital, we just call it an SVT for short. And so the treatment algorithm is massively tested on your exam. You need to know this. So first line is vagal maneuvers. So you put ice over the face. You can do carotid sinus massage, have the patient cough or valsalva down like they're trying to go to the bathroom and have a bowel movement. That's your first line treatment, vagal maneuvers. Vagal maneuvers could fail. Oftentimes they do. So you move on to adenosine. Adenosine is going to decrease the heart rate. So I remember D for adenosine and then D for decrease the heart rate. And then if the patient's unstable or adenosine fails and 
the patient has a low blood pressure, so they're hypotensive, plus this high heart rate, you want to cardiovert them. All right, so keep that in mind. If the patient's blood pressure starts dropping down into the 90s, the 80s, you want to start considering cardioverting them. All right, number 11. Patient that has a murmur that is quieter with increased preload or afterload. So you have inspiration and it's quieter. If you have squeezing the hands, it's quieter. That's going to be hokum, right? So the only murmur that really increases in intensity with Valsalva is going to be hokum. The only murmur that's quieter with increased preload and afterload is hokum. The only murmur that gets louder with Valsalva is going to be hokum. And sure, there are some minor exceptions to this, but this will get you your points on the NBME. So think of hokum as kind of the weird murmur that doesn't fit in with the rest of murmurs. Okay, because usually if you increase the preload to the heart, there's more blood going through the heart. So all of the murmurs are going to be exacerbated for the most part. Hokum is different because if you increase the preload, it's going to stretch out that atrium ventricle and that intraventricular septum that's collapsed over, and it's going to decrease the murmur. So hokum is different. Nail that into the back of your head. It gets worse whenever the patient valsalvas, but it's quieter with basically every other movement. All right, number 12, infective endocarditis plus a new murmur. You want to do a stat repeat echo because that new murmur can indicate that there is severe valvular damage that just occurred. All right, number 13, patient has severe hypertension plus retinopathy. Well, what would you find? So we're going to pull open a picture here so you can see the patient's retina. All right, and so some of the things that are high yield to know are retinal hemorrhages, constricted retinal arterioles, lobular choroidal infarcts, hard exudates, and then linear inner retinal hemorrhages and hypertensive retinopathy. And keep in mind that the phrase round hemorrhages of the middle retina is associated with diabetic retinopathy. So if you see round, you think diabetic. If you see linear hemorrhages, you're thinking hypertensive. All right, and here's what it looks like. Here's some of the hard exudates. All right, that is hypertensive retinopathy. And you can look out here, you see the constricted arterioles as well. Okay, for your family med shelf, you need to know blood pressure goals in adults is less than 140 over 90. If the patient has diabetes or CKD, the goal is less than 130 over 80. So you have to be a little bit more constrictive with your blood pressure goals if they have other comorbidities. All right, here's a test taking tip from Action Potential. So on the USMLE, do not pick super slow scans like the radionuclide myocardial scan or a CTA for patients that are in cardiac shock or having an MI actively. These are going to be more useful for outpatient workup of angina or coronary artery disease. You're not going to go put them in a scanner or take a nuclear tracer and give that to them and wait for a couple hours while they're having a heart attack, right? So cross off those answer choices immediately for anything that's acute in the hospital for cardiac conditions, of course. Next, number 16, VSD can cause failure to thrive. You need to know this. So a little baby comes in, they fell off their growth curve. They're now sweating, they're fatigued, they're feeding, and they have a holosystolic murmur. This is VSD until proven otherwise. VSD can cause a left to right shunt. It's going to increase the pulmonary arterial hypertension. All that fluid is going to be in the lungs. You can then, over time, find a reversal of the shunt back to right to left, and that's going to be called Eisenmenger syndrome. So initially, the VSD is left to right, increase the pressure in the lungs, and now it shunts back from right to left. So remember, blood's always going to go from the high to the low pressure area. Once it reverses, that's called Eisenmenger syndrome. Number 17, which glycogen storage disease has cardiomegaly plus cardiomyopathy? This is Pompe, and I remember it as Pompe, right? It wrecks your pump, aka it wrecks the heart. So if you see a baby that has cardiomegaly, cardiomyopathy, you should have Pompe on your differential. Number 18, what has Kussmaul's sign? Kussmaul's sign is indicative of impaired right ventricular filling. So restrictive cardiomyopathy, right? It's restricted. It can't fill up with all that extra blood. A right ventricular infarct, same thing. The right ventricle could be immobile because it's infarcted. A huge PE. So you have all this clot in your vessels for your lungs, and it's causing a backup of pressure to the right side of the heart. So now you have impaired right ventricular filling. There's no outflow. D, tricuspid stenosis. Same exact thing. Now it's hard to squeeze through the tricuspid valve, so there's going to be impaired right ventricular filling. E, right-sided CHF. Same exact thing as with a right ventricular infarct. And then F, chronic constrictive pericarditis. So if you have 
I think of it as kind of like scarring at the pericardium of the heart. It's not going to be able to fill up the right ventricle as well. And so the treatment for chronic constrictive pericarditis is a pericardiectomy. And I've seen that show up one time. That's why I wanted to include that as a highlighted treatment. And then PS, for everybody asking what the F is Kuzmol sign, basically you get JVD with inspiration. So you take a big breath and you have prominent jugular venous distension in your neck. And then number 19, what is the treatment of cardiac tamponade? Pericardiosynthesis. So you basically go in there and drain out that fluid from around the heart. And this is different than a pericardiectomy that you would do for constrictive pericarditis. With constrictive pericarditis, you literally go in there and take out the pericardium of the heart. Whereas with cardiac tamponade, you just drain the fluid around the heart. So look at the ending of the word so you remember. Ectomy means to remove, so you remove the scarring of the heart. And then pericardiosynthesis means to basically drain it out. And so with cardiac tamponade, you want to keep in mind that the systolic blood pressure will decrease 10 millimeters of mercury during inspiration. This is called pulses paradoxus. One thing that's tricky is it's not a problem with your pulse, right? It sounds like it because it says pulses paradoxus, but it's a problem with your systolic blood pressure decreasing. So don't let that trip you up. Even if you're studying for step one, they might give you what is this and pulses paradoxus has nothing to do with the pulse. It's just systolic blood pressure decreased by 10 with inspiration. Okay, so that's everything. Those are some of the highest deal concepts for cardio on the USMLE. If you guys like this, let me know. I can put together some more reviews like this. If you guys have any questions, drop a comment down below. Find us on Twitter at action underscore AP. And look forward to talking with you guys soon.